Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 reads, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And there is sin that we must strive against. As born-again believers, we must, must not be actively practicing unrepentant, gross sin in our lives. We actually find this kind of clearly spelled out in Galatians chapter 5. If you read from 19 to 21, which I will read for you. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. And he says this, which I have told you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's pretty clear. If I'm living a life that practices those things, I'm not going to heaven. <laughs> that's what that says. If that's what marks my life. So resist sin in your life. Strive against it. Do not practice the works of the flesh. And let me just make a clear comment here. To practice is not the occasional slip or unintentional failure of the Christian. That's not what that's talking about. To practice is to be about those things in regular behavior, even seeking to get better at them, to protect them. This marks your life. This is the kind of person you are. You're doing these things. Well, the Christian strives against these things. The Christian resists a life that lives that way. That, that's what we're supposed to do. And like we said, though, last week, it isn't a matter of your effort overcoming these things. It's a matter of striving to keep your focus where it's supposed to be. And where is your focus supposed to be? On yourself? No, on Jesus, right? Eleven chapters of telling us Jesus is so much better. Eleven chapters of putting our focus on Him. Eleven chapters of reminding us that, that His is a better covenant. That His is by grace and by faith. That He is now sitting at the right hand of the Father as our great high priest making intercession for us. Eleven chapters of putting our focus on Jesus and then we're told, strive against sin. It has to be with the right focus. The focus is on Him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Run to Him. Abide in Him. And let His Word abide in you. Walk in the light as He is in the light. And strive against sin. Amen? You understand that? You know what we're actually talking about here? That verse was the, was the introduction to a topic. And the topic is your sanctification. That's actually what we're talking about here. You... Becoming the holy vessel of honor that God has called you to be. That's what we're talking about here. And you know, the topic of sanctification is an extremely important one. A vitally important thing for you, Christian, to understand is the topic of your sanctification. And we actually read in 1 Thessalonians 4.3, one of the few verses that says this so clearly, this is the will of God for you. Your sanctification. God's will for you is that you are sanctified. That's what he wants for you. And that's what the topic here that we're moving into is all about. It's about sanctification. 
The word sanctification, which means holy or holiness, actually the word is translated depending on its context and its, its uh, morph, depending on how it's put into the Greek, is sometimes translated holy or holiness. Right? It just depends on, on the context. So it means holy or holiness, to consecrate, to set apart. Now from the Easton Dictionary, let me read you uh, their introduction to the definition of the word sanctification. They say, sanctification involves more than a mere moral reformation of character. Brought about by the power of the truth, it is the work of the Holy Spirit bringing the whole nature more and more under the influence of the new gracious principles implanted in the soul in regeneration. In other words, sanctification is the carrying on to perfection the work begun in regeneration and it extends to the whole man. That is sanctification. That's what we're talking about here. And with that... We need to make some important distinctions regarding your sanctification. I want you to understand the whole picture here. For there are actually three phases, if you will, to your sanctification. Three phases. I put this in your notes. Positional. Progressive. I often call progressive practical. So whenever you hear me say like talk about practical righteousness, this is what I'm talking about. But, but a better theological word probably is progressive. And then final. So there are three phases to your sanctification. Positional, progressive, and final. So phase one is your positional sanctification or your positional holiness. All right? Here's the thing. When you put your faith in Christ, when you believed upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you received His grace unto salvation, positionally, you are sanctified. You are righteous in the eyes of the Lord. In heaven, before God, He sees you as fully sanctified, and that is now how He is dealing with you. As a sanctified person. Positionally, in Christ, you're totally sanctified. You're perfectly holy in his eyes. Why? Because you're in Jesus. You're, you're, you're covered in Jesus. And when God looks at you and deals with you, he's dealing with you according to Christ's righteousness. According to his perfect life. According to who he is. And so positionally, right now, Christian, positionally, in Christ, God is seeing you and dealing with you as a holy one, as one who has been set apart as a righteous person. You are already positionally sanctified. All right? Now, phase two, phase two is our progressive sanctification or practical sanctification because although God is dealing with you as a person who is holy, Christian, do you know the reality of your situation? You do, right? Practically speaking, are you holy? Have you completely stopped sinning? Is all of, are all of your thoughts perfectly aligned with God's will? Is all the intentions of your heart perfectly aligned with God's will? Well, no. We still have the sin nature. We're still dealing with sin in our lives. You understand this, right? I mean, I don't have to convince you of this, do I? You all know this is the reality we're in. Progressive sanctification is the process by which God, here and now, in this life, while in this body, is making me look more like Jesus. It's God dealing with sin in my life. Now, inward, outward, whatever it is, nature, character, however, it's God's progressive process of making me look more like Jesus. That is his work of sanctification in the life of the believer. That's happening now. You are currently in phase two, right? You're actually, that's working in your life right now. Now, phase three is our final sanctification. This is that day when we put off this body. 
When we're no longer in this body that, that has the sin nature attached to it, and we're given a new body, our final place of sanctification is when we have no more sin. No more sin nature. We're no longer have any part of us being in rebellion to God. That is the, 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 the place that God will take us. Now here's the thing to understand. He who began the first work, the one who, who saved you and is positionally sanctified you, will complete the second or the third phase, pardon me. You will one day be fully sanctified be, before the Lord. That's going to happen. You have a new body that is waiting for you. And it is not predicated upon how well phase two happens. Do you, you understand that? You, you, because it's all Christ. It's all Him. You've been sanctified positionally because of Jesus. One day, you will be given a new body because of Jesus. And the work He's doing now is because of Jesus. But the person who dies 13 seconds after they got saved are just as sanctified in phase three as the person who lives 70 years under that process. You have to understand that. This process of sanctification today is not the, what is needed to make me fully sanctified on that day. I'll get a new body. This body's just got to die, right? I just got to leave this tent someday and be given my mansion, right, that has no sin in it. That's the final phase. Now included in your notes, did everybody get notes? If you didn't, get some at the, on your way out, get a, an extra bulletin. Because there are eight scripture references on sanctification under the title, verses to look up later, and, and this, this church, this is your homework for the week, you're welcome. But, there are actually many, many verses, not just the eight I gave you. I gave you eight that have the clear focus on sanctification, right? Right? Um, but there are many, many verses in the New Testament that talk about our sanctification. And while Hebrews 12.4 is a sanctification verse, and many of these verses, like this one, put some of the responsibility on us. This verse says, for me, to strive against sin. 1 John 1.9 says, I need to confess my sins. There are verses that put some responsibility on us. And although that is true, Christian, the Bible is pretty clear that the ultimate work of your sanctification is God's work. That ultimately, He is the one who is doing the sanctification, not us. It's, all, it's really all on Him. It's all His work you got to understand that too, because Christians who think that you're responsible for your righteous activity get really caught up in either legalism or frustration by trying to fix themselves. It's his work. He's the one that's doing it. That's why we read in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Who began the work? He began it. Who's going to complete it? He did. That is the only way we can read being confident of this very thing. Because if it was up to me to complete this work, I could not be confident that it was going to happen. Right? H have you done that? Have you spent time trying to fix yourself? Have you done that? Oh, it's so frustrating. So frustrating. I, I recognize things in my character that do not line up with his. Do you? Do you? Uh, and I'm not. No, I'm not asking you to judge me here. I'm asking you to judge yourself. Do you line? Do you reckon? You're all like, yeah, woo. I mean, the list. No, no. Look at yourself. Are there things in your character, things in you that don't line up with his character? Right? Have you tried to fix those things? How did that go? Yeah, like, but it's not your work. It's his work. Your sanctification is his work. He started it. He's going to complete it. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you something you already know. Phase two. Phase two can be rather painful. Phase two 
Well, the process can feel kind of messy. It, it can be kind of difficult. Phase two, the one we're in, it could be hard. It could be hard. And, and this is actually where we pick up. Long introduction. I am going to get to the passages right now. You needed that. You needed to understand what we're walking into here. Because this is where we're walking into Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, where the writer is addressing the painful parts of our sanctification. Phase two, where we're at now. Look with me. I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to read from verses 5 all the way down to 11. This is our passage for this morning. And you have forgotten the exhortation which, which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness." Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Christian, this is the answer to the question. Why do Christians suffer and go through such difficult trials in this life? This is the answer, right here. It's for your chastisement, allowed by God for your sanctification. That is why God allows trials and tribulations in your life. That is why, Christian, you go through suffering. That is why you are in or have just left or are just headed into a trial. It's chastisement. Now. You go, the word chastisement rubs me the wrong way. Does the word chastisement rub you the wrong way? When you hear that word, you're like, I don't really like that word. Like that word doesn't say, it's because of our understanding of the word. All right? We put on that word a really negative connotation, don't we? When you hear the word chastisement, you're like, I've been chastised. You know, it's almost like it's really bad. And it might be really difficult. Okay, I'm not saying that. But it's not bad. And that's the thing that we misunderstand. Uh, this word here is literally used seven times in one form or another in this passage. So when a word is used that much, you really need to pay attention to it. Right? you got to go, okay, let's look at this word. The word chasten, chastise, chastisement, however it's uh, formulated there depending on the context, is to instruct, discipline for the purpose of instruction, education, nurture, right? Nurture or to correct. That is what this word means. And you need all of those words for us to understand the intention of the word within the context here. Now, thinking of all of those words, instruction. Discipline for the purpose of instruction or education or correction. Nurture. Is that what you were originally thinking when you had the word chastisement in your head? Probably not, right? But that's what it means. That's what it means, and that's where you need to see it in light of the passage. 
The chastisement of the Lord includes everything from the verbal correction that comes from His Word that convicts the heart of the believer and tells the believer, do or don't do whatever is in front of you. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my life. That is the chastisement of the Lord. And it could be as simple as a little prick against you to, to, to keep you from this way or to push you that way. Right? Education, correction, direction, nurture, it all fits in there. Right? It also would extend all the way over to the deepest trials of varying kinds that God allows in our lives to train us, mature us, and make us more like Jesus for His glory. It's the whole gamut, Christian. It's everything from the little word the Holy Spirit speaks to the grievous trial of suffering that His people from time to time walk through. It's all the chastisement of the Lord. Now, it's important to understand that this is not talking about judgment. There, did you read, when I read the definition of chastisement, did, did any of that speak to you of judgment? No, and that's not in this passage at all. That's, that's not what this is talking about. If you are in Christ, you are no longer under the judgment of God. Because God has placed the judgment on Christ for you. He has judged your sin on Christ on that cross. You're no longer under the judgment of God. He does not deal with you, Christian, if you are in Christ, if you have trusted Christ for your salvation, if you have believed upon His name, repented from your sins, and trusted Him. You have been born again. He's put His Spirit in you, and He now deals with you as His child. No longer as judge, but as child. And this is how this is to be seen. And that's why he gives us an example here of earthly fathers. Right, right in the middle of this, he takes us to that picture. The picture of an earthly father chastising their child. Let's read that again. Now I'm going to go all the way to verse 7. 7 to 10. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there from a father whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not a much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, I, I realize this. That unfortunately, this example is not going to produce the same positive understanding and view in all of us depending on the relationship or lack thereof that you may have had with your earthly father. I understand that, but the point it makes is pretty clear. And I think we can all recognize the point it's trying to make. That good fathers chasten their children. Good fathers chasten their children. So if you're not being chastened, you're not his child. That's very, very clear here. If you can get away with sin without any correction or check in your mind, heart, or life from God, either you have seared your conscience extremely or you are not his child. Every child of God is chastised by God. Now what does that chastisement look like? It's a ginormous scale of many, many things that God uses for that purpose. And he's very individualistic. He's very personal. He knows what you need. He knows how to speak to you. And your chastisement might not look anything like mine and vice versa. So there's, there's no scale here. I can't go, here's the scale of chastisement. And if you're not on it, no, 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 that doesn't exist. 
And you know, like you know when the Father's correcting you. Christian, do you not know? You know. I know. I know when he's, I know. Oftentimes I'm trying to ignore it or run from it, but I know. Right? If I'm his child, he's going to correct me. So if you're not being chastised in some way, shape, or form by the Father, he literally says you are illegitimate and not a son. You can't escape what it says. It's very clear. You know what that's supposed to do, though? It's actually not supposed to cause question. It's supposed to encourage confidence. You understand that's how that's supposed to be received, right? It's supposed to actually encourage confidence. My father loves me, and that's why he chastises me. I am actually his child. That's what that's supposed to do. This is speaking to suffering Christians. These Christians are in a really bad place, so much so that they're honestly starting to think about turning away because it's getting so heavy and so hard to follow Christ in their experience. And he's saying to them, no, 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 no. This should actually greatly encourage you that God is allowing this and working this in your life because he doesn't do that with people that aren't his children. So good fathers chasten their, ch their children. If you're not being chastened, you're not his child. Therefore, just as we subjected ourselves or are called to subject ourselves under the chastening of an earthly father who is not perfect and only doing what seemed best to him, you realize earthly fathers are flawed, right? There is no earthly father that is perfect in his chastening. I I've chastened incorrectly or over chastened if you will and I've probably underdone it on other things right I'm not perfect I do what seems best I'm trying to do what is best and if my children are called to submit under that how much more are we all called as his children to submit under a father who absolutely knows what is best he's not guessing He's not wondering, well, I really hope this is going to work out for their good. I'm not sure if I take them down this trial, if it'll actually produce something good. No, no, no. He knows. And the Bible says he's benevolent. Right? Our God is a benevolent God. Our God doesn't just know what's best, but out of love will do what is best for you every time. It's who he is, and it's what he can do. His chastisement is for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now it is important at this moment to kind of push pause because I want to make sure you're hearing the message that's being preached this morning correctly. Some of you could easily swing from what has been said. And I want to make sure that we walk in proper biblical balance. Very important. So let me try to make sure the pendulum is balanced here. All right? The chastisement of God is for the purpose of correction and instruction. To sanctify us. And yes, that means God is dealing with sin in us. That is a truth. But what that is not saying is that all the trials and difficulties that you are going through as a Christian in your life are because you're in rebellious sin. And if you would just repent, all of your trouble would go away. That is a false blanket statement. You cannot take it there. You should not take it there. And that is when the pendulum gets thrown over to one side because chastisement is dealing with sin, but not always, even probably most often not, gross, outward, unrepentant sin. More often, at least very often, in the life of the Christian, the trials and tribulations are there for your sanctification, which is the process God is going to take, listen, going to take all his children through. If you are his child, he will chastise you. 
Your chastisement will not look like mine. So why maybe does some believers go through heavier situations in life than others? I don't know. I don't know the mind of God. I, I, I don't know his ways. I can't give you all the answers that you might seek from a message like this. I know that what he's doing in you is good. I know that his purpose is good. And I know that just because you're really going through it does not mean that you are in some rebellious outward sin. I, I know that. Now let me balance the pendulum because we could have just thrown it all the way to one side over there, right? Let me balance it. Because if you are in rebellious, outward, gross sin, Christian, and you are his child, he will chastise you. And it could be from just the consequences of your actions. He'll do whatever he needs to do in your life to correct you. But if you're in that place, you know it. You're not wondering, oh, am I going through this because I'm in rebellious sin? Listen, Lord, am I in rebellious sin? He'll tell you. What you don't want to do is let other people tell you. Unless it's like you're living with and sleeping with outside of marriage or something really obvious, I might tell you. Listen, you're kind of going through a rough time because you're making really bad decisions here. The problem is this. When Christians who are suffering are being told that they just need to repent and it would stop. So often, guys, God is doing a work in you. I once heard this message, and it was a pastor talking. And the pastor was sharing about a really difficult season in his life where it just seemed like wave after wave was hitting him. And he was explaining details which I would be amiss to even try to do, right? But he shared his experience about it and then said he was overwhelmed and confused and struggling and he went to his pastor. Why am I going through all of this? His pastor's response, welcome to the deep end of the pool. You know, it, God loves you and knows what you need and is doing works in you that are deep, that are meaningful, that are powerful. And because he's benevolent and he only does what is good, it's necessary or else he wouldn't do it. Does that balance the pendulum okay? Do you see the balance? Hey, if you're in gross, unrepentant sin, yeah, God's going to chasten you. I think you'll know what's going on. Like, you'll, you're not going to, you may be lying about it or, or, or uh, uh, trying to deceive others that it's going on, but you know if there's a reason for it, right? But, but more often than not, in the life of the believer who's not practicing gross open sin because you are a believer, right? You're not walking in the flesh and fulfilling its lusts. You're going to go through chastisement. And it's because not all of you is lined up with Christ yet, has it? Are you perfectly patient? Do you have faith that is throwing mountains around? Have you arrived yet? No, me neither. Right? None of us has arrived yet. So is there still work to be done in me? Paul, at the end of his life, was like, I haven't arrived yet. If anybody had arrived yet, it would have been Paul, and he had not arrived yet. None of us have. There's always work to be done. When you're taking us and comparing us to Christ, there's always work to be done. And that's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. Either way, listen, no matter what the reason for the chastisement, either way, it is for your good. And it's something that the Bible actually tells us we should have joy in and be thankful for. And I really love James for this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This is what God is doing. This is what God wants for you. He is perfecting you. He is doing a good work in you. It's really important to see this balanced. It's for your sanctification. I have met many people who have heard this on the wrong side. And it becomes, well, look at what he says here. In the beginning of, these, of uh, chapter 12, verse 5, he says this actually halfway through chapter or verse 5. He says, my son, do not despise the chasing of the Lord nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. And I think that in varying degrees, these are the most common reactions that Christians end up struggling with regarding the chastisement they're dealing with. They, they are either growing to despise the trial, or they're becoming discouraged by it. Right? One of these two things, or maybe you, you swung back and forth between them. One day you just feel just angry about it, the next day you feel totally discouraged about it. Have you been there? Have you been in that place, Christian? Have you gone through trials where you feel discouraged and then disdain, you know? Despise and then discouraged and you kind of go back and forth. This is because you've lost sight of why. You've, you've either heard a lie and believed it. You've heard the condemnation of the devil and believed it. You've talked yourself into seeing it the wrong way. And God wants to free you from that. God wants you to know that He's doing a good work in you. Listen, this morning, it's time to see your trial, your suffering, for what it is. God's love. It's time to see it for what it is. It's your Father loving you. The Bible gives us a lot of scriptures that speak to the Father regarding their children. That is, me as a dad and my children. And it tells me, if I love them, I will chastise them. If I love them, I will correct them. If I'm not willing to correct them, that is actually me not loving them. God's doing a work in your life because He loves you. Anytime this topic comes up, you know, I you got to be careful to, to live in that balance. This is one of those topics that the pendulum can easily move into places that bring me into either a despising or a discouraged place. Even a simple word from, if you heard, misheard something this morning, it could do that. That's, what I'm, that's why it's such a careful need for this balance because the smallest thing could send me off into the wrong direction. Sit in his love. It is his love for you that has allowed this trial for you. I want to close with this last thought. It's so funny. Every time I've said that lately, I'm like, Haha. it's like 15 minutes, so. The typical pastor clothes, right? Because if you're like me, a lot of your struggles or trials or, or the sufferings that you've endured, they're hard to understand and quite see like how God is using this in my life. Like what is he doing? Have you, have you been there? Am I alone in this? Or have you felt that? I really struggled back and forth with whether to share this with you or not, but I'm going to share it with you because I think 
vulnerability is a, is a really good thing when you need to hear my heart, okay? So some of you know this, but most of you don't. For about 14 years, I have had a medical challenge that is unidentified. They don't know, like I've gone to the doctors, they don't know what I'm dealing with. Um, I've been told it's simple partial seizures. I've been told it's migraines. I've been told it could be thyroid. I've been told it could be a brain tumor, which I've had a scan, and then I didn't have a brain tumor then. But it causes, from time to time, for me to, this is sound really weird, smell things that are not there, but to such a degree that my eyes burn, I can taste it. It's like I'm sitting in a room with a car running and uh, it's filling up with exhaust. It makes me feel lightheaded and dizzy. It makes me feel sick to my stomach. It makes my head go in a different place like I'm in a cloud. Sometimes you may talk to me and I seem like I'm not there. I'm trying really hard to be in the moment, but I'm literally floating off in Neverland. And I've suffered from this for the last 14, 15 years. And I've had hands laid upon me. I've prayed intensely. I've been anointed with oil. I've gone to the doctors. I've tried medications, and I've never found any relief. And it'll last for weeks on end without any relief. And I'll be honest with you, as I was going through this, I sat before the Lord and said, Lord, I'm reading what you're saying here to me, and I believe you for it, but how is this doing a good work in me? So am I the only one in the room that has asked those questions? Or have you asked those questions? Along comes Romans 8, 28 through 30. And some of you are like, yeah, I have that one written in Sharpie on my wall. <laughs> right? like, like, I've thought about tattooing it on my forearm, you know what I mean? I check every now and then just to make sure it's still there. Is it still there? Yeah, it's still there. Let's read that together. Because these guys, these are sanctification verses. Did you know that? You may not have realized that. There are tons and tons and tons of sanctification verses that don't use the word sanctification, but that's what it's talking about. And these are sanctification verses. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined, predestined what? To be conformed to the image of His Son. Sanctification. He predestined those He foreknew we're going to be like Jesus. Phase one, phase two, and phase three. That he might be the firstborn among... Did I skip a part? No. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, like Jesus, who is the firstborn among all of us that have believed, moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. Whom he called, those he also justified, and whom he justified, though these he also glorified. Oh! The amazing promises. You know, I always bring this out, and it's super important, because it says, and we know. It doesn't tell me I understand. It doesn't even promise I will understand. It doesn't tell me I'm going to get it. It tells me I've got to know these things. I know that God is good. And there are mornings, guys, that I walk up these stairs pleading with my Father to show up 
because I'm having one of those spells, whatever it is, and the room is just crazy for me. And you know what's amazing? In my weakness, He is strong. He's promised that, hasn't He? Christian, we cannot pretend to understand all the details of why God has allowed one thing in this life and another in that life and something different over here and why He's done this here. We don't know all those details. I reason to say we can't. But that's not really what we're told to try to figure out. We're told to trust the God in whom has us who is holding us, who loves us, and who is going to do in us the things that He knows is best for us to make us look like Jesus. And listen, very important, for the purpose of testimony. If you want a reason, here's the reason. I only got one because I don't know all the other reasons. He wants to bring glory to His name through your life, so that people around you can see who he is and trust him for their salvation. Who here has not watched someone go through a grievous trial and had your faith grow by watching them? Have you not experienced that? Who here has seen people saved Maybe in your own life or others through the grievous trials God has taken that believer through. Oh, he's doing a work. Believe me, Christian, he is doing a work. And you might not always see or understand what all of that brings. And when I sat and asked the Lord, why? You know, he didn't give me a direct answer. But I was able to come up with things that I think have developed in my life because of this. And one of those things is I'm willing to walk up here when I literally feel like I should be laying down and, you know, knowing he's going to show up. And if not for me, he does it for you, right? Because he's not going to leave you dry. It's built my faith in him in ways that I just have to believe nothing else would. Else he wouldn't allow it. And that is true in your life, too. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Do not become discouraged by it. Be thankful that the Father of love is working in your life a good work. If you're not in a trial right now, you probably just came out of one, or you're about to head into one. You know this. Of some kind, of some sort. Know that God loves you. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. He's a liar and a jerk. And he whispers, and he speaks, and you need to reject it. You need to cling to the scriptures. You need to cling to the promises of God. You need to know that God is good, and in him there is only light. And all that he does is good. And you, Christian, you who have trusted Christ, you are his child. And he loves you. And he is doing good in you. And I know that does not make every day easy. And I know that you will still suffer and struggle. I know that. But you have to hang on to his love. And you have to trust him for it. If you were to ask me, man, with what... And you know what? I know what I'm dealing with is nothing compared to, to many. And I don't pretend it is. But it really stinks for me, literally. I smell things that aren't there. But if you were to ask me, 
If you denied Christ today, knowing that that trial would go away, would you deny Christ? No way. He is my God. He is my Father. And I know you feel the same way. So hold on to Him. Stay close to Him. Keep your eyes focused on Him. And walk through whatever He has for you, knowing that He is doing a good work in you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we...